This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's going on and welcome to Covering the Spread. My name is Tom Vecchio with MLB opening day this Thursday. I'm here to break down some season-long bets. As always, this is one of the many shows on the FanDuel Podcast Network. You can find that anywhere, whether it's Apple Podcasts, whether it's Spotify. Make sure to give it a like, follow, or subscribe. The video version we found on FanDuel TV Plus and FanDuel.com slash watch. You can find it up on the FanDuel YouTube page. You can find the article up on FanDuel.com slash research. Before we hop into things, say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or the number one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel's offering online sports wagering in Kansas under agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager, only $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem, call 100 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, or Vermont, call 100 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, call 1 888 7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. Call 1-800-9 with it in Indiana. Call 1-800-522-4700 or visit kscamblinghelp.com in Kansas. Call 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 100gambler.net in West Virginia or call 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050-424-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope Y in New York. All right, I am here to break down MLB opening day, or not opening day, I should say, MLB for season-long bets. As Jim mentioned at the end of last week, I will be here today on Monday. Austin Swain will be with you tomorrow. I will be back on Wednesday to talk more MLB. Jim will be back on Thursday. So we're here to talk about specifically season-long bets, nothing to do with the actual opening day games. There are Four bets that I really like this season. We'll get into them. If you were here last year for this exact show, Jim was hosting. I was a guest last year. Uh, my my big take for the pod last year was Matt Olson at 28-1 to 1 to lead the league in home runs. And after 162 games, that came to fruition. A really nice winner. It's a season-long bet. We have to understand what these season-long bets, league leader bets, what they mean. Really high odds, low impl- low imply probability, but it gives you some you know some action throughout the season. You can find different ways to hedge out of it, whatever it might be. So when it comes to the home run market this year, I guess I should note on it just because I you know hit the uh, league leader last year with Matt Olson. When it comes to the odds this year, there are very very few spots that I like. I spoke about Ronald Acuna briefly on some other shows. He was at nineteen to one. Currently on the FanDuel Sportsbook, he's at 14-1. to I will always say shop for the best lines available, as Jim continuously mentions. I will do the same. You can find Ronald Acuna at 19-1 to across the industry to lead the league in home runs. That's the lowest number that I would look for a player right now. If you were to ask me, who do I think leads the league in home runs this year, and which is simply just a prediction, right, and there were no betting odds attached, my answer would be Pete Alonso. However, I don't have interest in Pete Alonso at 8-1. to now, if someone else gets to a, you know, a couple of players get off to a super hot start and Pete Alonso falls back and we can get Pete Alonso at 14 to 1, 15 to 1, 12 to 1, somewhere around there, that's where I'll be looking to jump in on Pete Alonso. But right now at a plus 800, I have no interest in that number, no interest in Judge. Like I said, the first player that I'll, I'll be looking to would be Ronald Acuna. Now, I don't mind taking some shots on maybe a longer shot like Julio Rodriguez at 40 to 1. That is certainly fine. But. Acuna is probably my favorite. The combination of his probability to actually do it and his overall skill set combined with the odds actually having to be good. And that's what we do get with Acuna. Again, shot for the best lines available. So let's get into my favorite season-long league leader bet this season. And it is going to be Bobby Witt Jr. at 18-1 to to lead the league in hits. 
Bobby Witt is obviously a fantastic player, and there's plenty to back this up. I will say from the jump, any stats that I uh, I reference are either from fan graphs or baseball savants. I also don't do any of my own projections. We can find projections on fan graphs. The people that do these projections are obviously fantastic. We can look at the projections. We can see where he stands, all these sorts of things. So at 18 to 1, Bobby Witt to lead the league in hits. That is a 5.3 implied probability. Very low. We have to take all this into consideration. When we look at Bobby Witt and his actual production from last year, he had a 17.4% striker rate, which is great. He had a 218 ISO, which is obviously strong. We're not here for necessarily power, but that is obviously good to see. He had a 295 Babbitt, which is batting average of balls in play. And when we look at his some of his underlying stats between his ex-WOBA, ex-batting average, and ex-slugging, they were all in the 91st percentile or higher. And when we flip to his baseball savant page, it's as red as can possibly be. Now, the chase rate is a little bit low. We'd like to see that improve. But the point being is Bobby Witt is a fantastic player. So when we look back to last year, Bobby Witt had 177 hits. When we look to some of his projections for this year, again, on fan graphs, not doing any of my own projections, he's right around that same mark. Whether we're looking at Steamer or Zips or the bat or whatever it might be, they all have him at that same mark, about 170, maybe a little bit higher. When we look at the season-long projections for Bobby Witt in terms of the overall leaderboards, the projections have him at about 5th, 6th, 7th in some spots, depending on you know what uh, specific projection we're looking at. So Bobby Wood is a top five player when it comes to projected hits. His stats should be on the rise this year in terms of his projection, in terms of his chase rate. He has a, a very strong strikeout in terms of it being low. He's not wasting chances at the plate. He's putting the ball in play. He has enough power. He's going to be at the top of the Royals lineup. And while they may not be the best offense overall, he's going to have plenty of plate appearances to put him in a good spot for hits. So when we're looking at his odds and we see him realistically where he should be, as I said, projected for the sixth, seventh hits, maybe the fifth most hits. At 18 to 1, I like where he sits compared to some of the other players. I don't have interest in Ronald Acuna. I don't have interest in Luis Arise. Freddie Freeman, we can maybe make the case for if his odds were a little bit longer. Same thing with Bo Bichette. If we can get Bo Bichette at 15 to 1, I would have a ton of interest there, but he's sitting at 10 to 1 right now. So Bobby Witt brings the combination of odds and probability that I do like backed by very strong projections. So Bobby Witt at 18 to one to lead the league in hits. That is the first part. Next up, there are three player season o uh, total over unders that I like one hitter and then two pitchers. And for the hitter, we can maybe look at his uh, odds to lead the league in home runs. So let's start with the hitter. It's a little bit more exciting. Four home runs. Adolis Garcia, over 31 and a half home runs this season, sitting at minus 113. His odds to lead the league in home runs, I believe, are sitting at 40 to 1. Let's double check quickly for, yeah, it's 41 for Adolis Garcia. If I like him to go over 31 and a half, I have a, a slight interest in him to lead the league in home runs as well. Understand what that probability is, though. So over 31 and a half, when we look at Adolis Garcia over the past few seasons, he's ended with 31, 27, and 39 home runs last year. He has tremendous power. A 212 ISO, a 207 ISO, and a 263 ISO over the last few seasons. The issue with Adolis Garcia are the strikeouts. He swings and misses a lot, but man, when he makes contact... He has a ton of power. So this is a player that can have a higher range of outcomes. And much of what much of that can be shown on his baseball savant page, where the power, the exit velocity, the barrel rate, the hard hit rate are fantastic. But the strikeouts are there. The strikeouts are certainly there for Adolis Garcia. So if we look at the potential upside for Adolis Garcia, it's him pushing towards 40 home runs. I don't expect him to fall, you know, massively below the 31 and a half number. If he's going to be anywhere, it's going to be right at that number and he's going to miss it by one or two. He's not going to end the season with 17 home runs. That's just not the type of hitter that he is. So, yes, I want to bank on a player's theoretical upside rather than looking at a floor outcome for them. We want to bank on the ceiling outcome for them. 
And that is Adolis Garcia, again, backed by strong projections, getting right to this number, sitting at 31, sitting at 32, maybe even getting up to the mid-30s. So if he can stay healthy and play a, a high volume of games surrounded by a fantastic lineup with Texas, he's always going to be in a good spot to hit. And that's one of the things I said about Matt Olson last year is kind of along the same lines as Adolis Garcia. When I specifically said it about Matt Olson last year, it's like when Ronald Acuna is on base and Austin Riley's on base and then Matt Olson is up and uh, Sean Murphy is behind them and Ozzie Albies is there. You can't pitch around Matt Olson. He has to see good pitches. That's largely the same for Dolores Garcia. When they have a loaded lineup, they can't just put pitches out there and, and let Adolis Garcia on base for free because there's going to be some other power hitter coming up behind him. So I like Adolis Garcia and his upside over 31 and a half home runs this season. And again, if you want to take a, a small sprinkle on him to lead the league in home runs, you can do that as well. Now, two season-long strikeout props for pitchers. And when it comes to pitchers, I generally err on the side of caution. And generally that means taking some unders. And when it comes to taking unders on pitchers season long, there's obviously a lot that can go wrong for pitchers. Missing a start here or there can really throw off their projections in a big way. Missing any significant amount of time, if you take the under, a pitcher missing any significant amount of time puts you in a great spot. You know, we don't want to root for injuries, but injuries are just a thing when it comes to pitchers. And a lot of teams are very, very cautious when it comes to their pitchers. And I also think, as we get to the end portions of the season, it does allow you to hedge out in a certain way where if a player is approaching their season-long prop, you can look to them when they start games and you can look to take an over on their strikeouts and potentially you know, make back some of the initial bet. So let's go to two pitchers. It's going to be both unders for their season-long strikeouts, and that's starting off with Nestor Cortez for the New York Yankees, under 139 and a half strikeouts, sitting at minus 113. When we look to Nestor Cortez, he obviously missed a significant amount of time last year. He only pitched 63.1 innings. The year before that, he pitched 158.1. The year before that, he was at 93. His K per nine and his strikeout rate are nearly identical over this three-year sample size. He was up at 27.5% strikeout rate, 26.5, and last year was at 25.2. So the lowest of the three years was last year, also from the smallest sample size. Last year, he also struggled with home runs. Last year, we also saw the highest walk rate from Nesta Cortez up at 7.5. And while 7.5 7 is not a bad walk rate, it just was the highest that he's posted of the three main years that he's been in the league, not compared to you know prior when he was with a handful of teams not pitching a large sample size. He's not a dominant strikeout pitcher is what it comes down to. He's a league average strikeout pitcher, slightly above league average. He can pile up the strikeouts when the uh, matchup allows it, but he's not routinely going to be going to be going out there pushing towards eight, nine, 10 strikeouts on a game by game basis, start by start basis. He's going to be around five, six, maybe seven strikeouts to start uh, spring training. He has a 23.5% strikeout rate. And again, comes from a very small 14 inning sample size. It is an indication. We can't use it as a uh, set in stone because the sample size is so small. When we're looking at the Yankees overall, I'm trying to take into consideration where their team and their pitching staff is combined with Nestor Cortez, who did, again, struggle to stay healthy last year. Considering Garrett Cole is already uh, injured to start the season, whatever status may be, I'm under the assumption that the Yankees are going to play things a little bit safer this year when it comes to pitchers. If they have to force a pitcher to miss any pitcher, Rodone or Cortez or anyone, to miss an extra start, they'd rather do that than push them out there considering their pitching staff isn't already at full health. So when it comes to Nestor Cortez, and we're seeing 63 innings last year and 67 strikeouts and 158 innings and 163 strikeouts and 93 innings and 103 strikeouts over the past three, years, three seasons with the Yankees, he has to be out there in order to obviously rack up the strikeouts. And considering where his health has been and the Yankees pitching staff overall, I'm playing this a little bit cautious. You know, we'd expect a seal. We would need not expect. We would need a ceiling season from Nestor Cortez with 130 innings minimum in order for him to get to 130 or 140 strikeouts in order to hit the over. So I'm playing things a little bit safer. And again, it gets to the end of the season and he's staying fully healthy. We can obviously look to hedge out of this as well. Let's go to the final pitcher 
for another under on a strikeout prop, and that's going to be Zach Gatlin under 192 and a half strikeouts, sitting at minus 113. I think Zach Gallon is a fantastic pitcher. He really is. He's truly one of the best in the National League. However, I think this projection is just a touch high, and it's based off of what we've seen from him the past two seasons, which were granted great seasons. We just have to look at that in full context and look at it in terms of will he be able to re repeat those performances. So last year, 210 innings pitched, 220 strikeouts. He had a 26% strikeout rate overall. In 2022, we saw 184 innings from him and 192 strikeouts, and he had a 26.9% strikeout rate. The year before that, he had 121 innings and 139 strikeouts with a 26.6% strikeout rate. So we have seen his strikeout rate trend slightly down last year at 26% when it was up at 26.9 and 26.6%. His innings are strong. He has been healthy. However... However, we always want to look at what's a potential floor outcome for these pitchers. And that floor outcome for Zach Gallon would be his strikeout rate continuing to decline, getting toward 25.2, 25.3. His innings are scaled back slightly. And instead of hitting over 200 again this year, he sits at 190, 195. And that means he would need to be exactly efficient as he was last year, this year, in order to hit 193 strikeouts. So Zach Gallen, while he's fantastic, last year was a ceiling year for him with 210 innings pitched and 220 strikeouts. So if his strikeout rate continues to decline and his innings are scaled back ever so slightly this year, it's going to be razor thin for him to hit the over. Now, I think he's a fantastic real-life pitcher, and it, you know, obviously a player anyone would, want, anyone would want on their team. He's great with limiting home runs. He's great at inducing ground balls. He's great at limiting the hard contact. But... Those strikeouts could be on the decline this year. And again, we'll look at his spring training numbers, which is a very small 13-inning sample size. He has a 14.3% strikeout rate and an 11.1% walk rate. So strikeout rate, which is obviously nowhere near where he was over the past few seasons. His walk rate is at 11%. It was at 5.6 last year. 5.6 is fantastic. Again, a super small sample size, but are we using that as an indication where maybe he starts the year super slow? And if he starts the year slow on strikeouts, he may eventually return to the form he was at last year. But that projection is going to be uh, you know, trailing from behind if he does start the year slow because he's not racking them up at the same rate. So again, I always like to play things a little bit safer when it comes to pitchers. And again, if we get to the end of the year in August, September, and he's at 280 some odd innings, and he's sitting here at 180 strikeouts, yeah, we can look to take some overs on him on a start-by-start -start basis. And then we make back our initial bet and we come out net even. So that's what I like to do when it comes to pitchers side on the side of caution. There's just so much that can go wrong for a pitcher in a season. Missing one or two starts can throw off his projection by 12, 13 strikeouts. And then we'd be cruising to an under. So when it comes to the lead league league leader market in strikeouts, Spencer Strider is by far the favorite. There's not many players that can compete with him when it comes to his strikeout rate overall. Kevin Gossman is there for me, the fact, but Kevin Gossman isn't healthy. right? Uh, I believe he's going to miss the opening day start, so I'm a little bit hesitant on Kevin Gossman. Pablo Lopez, Tyler Glass now, Hunter Green in this range, I think they're all fine. Dylan Cease, again, is good. Uh, the, walks are, the walks and home runs are always an issue for Dylan Cease. Corbin Burns is the player I'm going to have the most interest in if we see that number get a little bit longer. If we, can, if we see Corbin Burns at 17-1, to 1, that's something I would take some shares of. He is one of the favorites to win the, the AL Cy Young, now with the Orioles, AL Cy Young. So I will have some interest in Corbin Burns if we can find uh, a live number once the season starts, around 15 or 17 to 1 to lead the league in strikeouts. So that does it for today's podcast. We have Bobby Wick to lead the league in hits at 18 to 1. Really like the projection for him this year, like him obviously going forward throughout his career. Adolis Garcia, over 31 and a half home runs. Immense power. Yes, the strikeouts can be an issue for Garcia, but the power and realistically the lineup around him are both fantastic. And then when it comes to strikeouts, Nestor Cortez for the New York Yankees, under 139 and a half strikeouts. And then Zach Gallen for the Diamondbacks, under 192 and a half strikeouts. 
So that does it for today's podcast. Austin Swain will be here with you tomorrow. I will be back on Wednesday. Jim will be back on Thursday, and we will keep things rolling. As a reminder, this is one of the many shows on the FanDuel Podcast Network. You can find that anywhere, whether it's Apple Podcasts or it's Spotify. Make sure to give it a like, follow, or subscribe. Leave a review. That'd be greatly appreciated. You can follow me on Twitter at Tom underscore Vecchio1. Until next time, good luck with your bets. 